with uh, phase transmission. So we are going to raise the transformation temperature now. Martin said transformation is completed, a completely diffusionless reaction, which happens when you cool fast enough to avoid all the other transformations. And the way we look at transformations is using a time temperature transformation diagram. And just to remind you, if I take my parent phase and I cool it rapidly and hold it at that temperature, then it takes a certain amount of time to initiate transformation, and that's essentially what this diagram represents. Now, if we focus on just one of these time temperature transformation diagrams, uh, it consists essentially of two C curves. Okay? Uh, does anybody know why we have a C curve? Okay, if I plot the rate of reaction essentially, so this is the time and the temperature, then particular transformations follow a C curve. Any idea why we have a C curve? There's nucleation growth components that maximize the different um, temperatures. Exactly. So at high temperatures, um, we have a low driving force. So delta G is low because we are close to the equilibrium transformation temperature. But the diffusion coefficient is high. Diffusion coefficient is high. Whereas at low temperatures, diffusion coefficient is low and delta G is large. And therefore, at intermediate temperatures, you get a fast rate of reaction. They both are reasonable in magnitude. So oh, any particular reaction will show a C curve dependence. Here, the driving force for transformation is small. Here, the diffusion coefficient is small. And we have an optimum rate of reaction at intermediate temperatures. I'm not sure I understand how at a single time you have two temperatures. Okay, so the way the isothermal transformation diagram is generated is we supercool our parent phase to a particular temperature, we hold it there, and then we note the time for the initiation of transformation. Now, at this high temperature, the time is at, but if I supercool it to this temperature, oh, okay, yeah, thank you. Each of these diagrams you can divide into really two C curves, one for reconstructive transformations and one for displacive transformations. So displacive transformation is where you change the crystal structure by a deformation of the lattice. It doesn't require diffusion. And a reconstructive transformation, you break all the bonds and rearrange the atoms into a new crystal structure, allowing diffusion so that strain is minimized. So that's like when, for example, water freezes to ice, the shape of the container doesn't change other than just the volume change uh, accompanying the freezing process. Now, notice over here that if I compare the iron carbon alloy with the iron carbon with some manganese added, then the effect on this C curve is much greater than the effect on this C curve. Note that this is a, a logarithmic scale here. Any ideas why the reconstructive reaction is affected much more than the displacive reaction by the addition of alloying elements? It's because it's due to diffusion. Exactly right. So, of course, manganese will affect the thermodynamics of both kinds of reactions. Yeah, the free energy change will be altered, whether it's a displacive or a reconstructive transmission. But in this case, the manganese has to diffuse during transmission, and that really does have a large effect on retarding the reaction. Okay. So reconstructive transformations, there are two effects. One is the thermodynamic effect. The free energy change is influenced by the addition of manganese. And the second factor is that these elements will partition between the parent and the product phases. And therefore, will slow down the transformation by the need for diffusion. So this is a simple way of looking at the time temperature transformation diagram. There is much more detail within each of these. And today we are going to focus on this reaction, which is the Bainite reaction, which happens above the martensite start temperature and below the temperature at which uh, perlite forms. Now, Bainite is essentially a non-lamellar aggregate of ferrite and 
semen duct. So if you look at the microstructure of what we call upper bainite, uh, upper bainite forms at a relatively high temperature here, and lower bainite at a lower temperature. It makes sense. But upper bainite consists of these platelets, very fine platelets of ferrite, separated by regions of semen duct. And the scale is indicated here. Each platelet is of the order of 10 micrometers in size and a fraction of a micrometer in thickness. Lower bainite, by contrast, also has cementite precipitation inside the plate of ferrite. So obviously, the amount of cementite that forms between the plates is smaller because there's the same concentration of carbon. Now, notice that this scale is below the resolution of an optical microscope. In an optical microscope, the wavelength of light that you use is of the order of 5 to 600 nanometers, in other words, 0.5 to 0.6 of a micrometer. So you cannot resolve individual plates using an optical microscope. That's a fact of life. To observe bainite, you need to use transmission electron microscopy. But Supposing I uh, look at this in an optical microscope, then there are lots and lots of interfaces in this region, and all those interfaces are etched when you uh, chemically attack your sample. So this region will appear dark. And when I show you an optical micrograph, you see that the bainite etches dark. So you can use information like that to deduce that you do have bainite. But you cannot resolve the individual features without using transmission electron microscopy. What we are going to do is we are going to explain how this kind of a microstructure arises. And in order to do that, we need to understand the atomic mechanism by which the transformation happens. This is just to illustrate a real micrograph of upper bainite. Notice the scale here, one micrometer. And this is a transmission electron micrograph, which shows that we have a cluster of plates of ferrite, and in between we have the cementite regions. So the bainite forms as a cluster of plates, and these clusters are known as sheaves of bainite. So a sheave of bainite. And all of these platelets are in the same crystallographic orientation in space. <coughs> now, this microstructure is much, much finer than that of martensite. You know, martensite plates, you can even observe optically. So they are coarse plates, and they grow until they are stopped by an austenite grain boundary. <coughs> this is uh, the similar structure of low bainite. You can see the scale here. But in addition, we have, in addition to the cementite particles between the platelets, we also have cementite precipitating inside the ferrite. So at the moment, I'm summarizing all the characteristics of bainite. And two of the features that we've noted is that the plates of bainite are very fine compared with martensite, and that we have all the cementite precipitation, which we don't have with martensite. Martensite with when we observe it, it has the same chemical composition as the parent phase. It's only when you temper it that you get cementite precipitation. Okay, uh, in three dimensions, these plates of bainite are truly plate shaped. In other words, they are not needles. We very frequently confuse uh, ourselves by looking at just two dimensional sections. This is a two surface image. So. This edge is between two inclined surfaces. So we can follow this particular plate on the second surface, and therefore we know that it truly is in the form of a thin plate. Now notice that this bainite appears to be dark. Yeah, this is what I was pointing out to you, that when we etch it, there is a lot of detail inside this. And therefore, all those interfa interfaces are attacked by the etchant, and that scatters light, and therefore, the bainite appears to be dark. 
So this is a distinguishing feature of bainite. When you etch it, because of all the fine features inside the sheaves of bainite, we see it as dark. Now, the fact that it is in the form of a plate in three dimensions immediately indicates to you that it is possible that the mechanism of transformation is displacing. Because in a displacive transformation, you have a lot of strain energy. And we learned in the last lecture that to minimize strain energy, the product phase adopts the shape of a thin plate. So if I now look at displacements caused when the vein forms, I should be able to pick up an invariant plane strain shape change with a large shear component and uh, a dilatation component normal to the heavy plane here. So, if I polish a sample completely flat, allow it to transform to Bainer, we should be able to pick up the shape change. And indeed, you do pick it up. Now, in this case, we have to observe using a technique called atomic force microscopy because, again, in interference, like optical interference microscopy, the resolution is not enough to pick up individual platelets of vena. So this is a sample where we polish the surface completely flat, allow it to form vena, and then use atomic force microscopy to pick up the topology. Do you know what atomic force microscopy is? Okay, so roughly it works as <coughs> follows. We have uh, effectively a very sharp tip, okay. and that tip is maintained at a constant distance from a surface. Okay. Now, the way that is maintained at a constant difference is that you measure the force between that tip and your sample surface, and you move your uh, needle such that that force is maintained constant. And the way you operate this needle is that it's connected to a piezoelectric crystal, which takes the signal from that force, and it contracts or expands to maintain a constant distance. By doing that, you follow the topology of the surface. And therefore, you can produce a map like this, where, look, this distance is just 200 nanometers, and we are able to observe the displacements due to individual platelets of Bainite. Now clearly this is uh, a shear deformation. Okay. If, if you follow this, you can see that's a shear deformation. You measure it, the shear strain is the same as we observed with martensite of the order of 0 0.26. Now there is another interesting feature that you can see here, and that is this part here. There is plastic relaxation of the austenite adjacent to the plate. Now, just to illustrate that, when we form a blade of martensite, we pick up a deformation which looks like this. An invariant plane strain, which has a large shear component. When we observe the shape change due to bainite, it's slightly different. That yes, we have the shear deformation. But the austenite adjacent to the bainite has relaxed by plastic deformation. You can see this curvature here. And that happens because these strains are simply too large at the high temperatures where bainite forms for the austenite to accommodate them elastically. Okay. So basically, the transform transformation is causing deformation in the austenite adjacent to the plate of vein. And that has a very major consequence on the development of microstructure. So you can see this, you cause very severe deformation in the austenite adjacent to the plate of vein. Mm. In the last lecture, I emphasized that in order to get martensitic transformation or displacement transformation, the interface between the parent and product phases is glissal. Okay. So the dislocations in the interface must be able to move without diffusion. So for example, the abogus vector must lie out of the plane 
of the interface. So this is my modern side, and th this is the austenite. And these dislocations are able to glide without the need for diffusion. So that's called a glissal interface. Now, of course, it's not simply that these dislocations must be glissal, but we mustn't have many obstacles in the way of those dislocations. So can you think of the sort of obstacles that might interfere with the dis movement of a dislocation? Precipitation, did you say precipitation? Yeah, anything else? Other dislocations. So any obstacles that we put into the path of these, this array of dislocations will interfere with the progress of transformation. And this plasticity eventually kills the movement of the interface becomes impossible for the interface to move. And this has a very major consequence on the development of bainite, because what we see optically here is a single platelet of bainite. You can see the scale here. This is an optical microscope. Actually consists of thousands of tiny platelets of bainite, which grow to a limited size, and then they are killed by that plasticity. The transformation itself causes a shape change, which induces plastic deformation in the austenite, which stops the interface. So each platelet here grows to a size of the order of 10 micrometers and stops. Yeah. Whereas in the case of the martensite, the plate grows right across the growing boundary. So a martensite plate would be homogeneous and of that size. Here we have to renucleate the plate every time we want to continue transformation. Now this is very good for mechanical properties because basically we have refined the scale of the microstructure enormously with this plastic accommodation killing the progress of the plate. And this is why bainite forms in clusters of platelets or sheaves is that you form a platelet, it stops growing, you have to nucleate a new one, new one, new one, new one and so on. So the transformation is progressing by a series of displacement transformations. Everyone happy with that? So what sort of width is there between each of the platelets? Right. I mean, obviously it needs to be far enough away so it's a kill the unit. Yeah. So let me just uh, answer that question. And the question is, you know, what determines the width of an individual platelet and the spacing between platelets, right? So the width is determined by the point where plastic accommodation is sufficient to stop the movement of the interface. Now the distance between platelets is, okay, so let's say this is an individual platelet. Uh, we are going to prove that the platelet grows without any diffusion at all. So accept that for the moment, it grows without any diffusion. Carbon then escapes from this plate because we are forming bainite at a high temperature compared with martensite. So you establish a carbon diffusion field around here. And diffusion from the tip is much faster than this way because this is one dimensional and this has more dimension. So the next platelet to form will be near the tip of that platelet, and that is essentially what determines the spacing between the platelets. It's the dissipation of carbon until the next platelet can nucleate. The carbon actually retards transformation because it, it's an austenite stabilizing element. It's the dissipation of carbon which determines the spacing between platelets. Okay. You had a question? Why does it nucleate carbon? Grips, why not? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So that's that is the reason. Uh, this is one reason is that you dissipate carbon much more easily because you're partitioning in many dimensions at the tip than over here. But there is actually another reason, and that is that the strain field near the tip favors the formation of the same orientation. Whereas if you are forming another plate adjacent to it, then you would have to have a different crystallographic orientation which is more difficult to do. So these are very good questions, actually. Okay.
So, we generate an extremely fine microstructure. You can see the scale over here. And that must be good for mechanical properties if we are designing strong and tough steels. Right, now, we can look at the distribution of atoms at the interface between the bainite and the osmite. So, this image here, we have an interface between the bainite and the austenite, and each dot is a single atom. And I want to switch off the lights, just temporarily. Could somebody just pop out and switch off the lights from inside? Thanks. Just right next to you there is a button. Yeah, great. Thank you. Now, each dot here is a single atom. So we are, we are doing both position analysis and chemical analysis on the finest considerable resolution that you can have. And this is a feline microscope image. We can, using this technique, pull out individual atoms and measure how long they take to fly between two points. So that's time of flight mass spectrometry and determine their chemical composition. And we can capture particular species of atoms and form an image. So this is the distribution of iron atoms. You can see it's here uniform. This is the distribution of silicon atoms. And you can see that it's uniform. So we can conclude that substitutional solutes do not partition between the phases, even on the finest conceivable scale. But notice this. Can you see that the carbon atoms are on one side? Yeah, they are basically in the austenite. But what this experiment seems to indicate is that carbon is redistributed during transformation. But we need to question that, yeah, because at the temperatures where bainite forms, the carbon could escape very rapidly before we can do an experiment. So it may be a completely diffusionless growth, but the carbon will escape before we can do an experiment. Thanks very much. Can we have the lights back up? Okay, so, let's imagine that bainite forms exactly like martensite. There is absolutely no diffusion, no diffusion of carbon, silicon, or whatever. But we are forming this at a relatively high temperature, so it will temper itself. In other words, the carbon will escape from the state of bainite because it doesn't want to be there. And then it will precipitate as similar. That would give us our upper bainite microstructure. Okay. Now, if we transform this at a lower temperature to generate lower bainite, then the time required for diffusion is greater, so you have an opportunity to precipitate inside the plates of ferrite. Some carbon escapes and then precipitates between the plates. And that generates the microstructure of lower bainite. Now, we need to prove that this actually is the mechanism and that the bainite actually forms completely supersaturated with carbon. If, if we can prove that, then the entire microstructure is explained. Now, the trouble is that the time taken for this carbon to escape here is actually very short at the temperatures where bainite forms 4 or 500 degrees centigrade. If you like, I can, um, it looks like this diagram is not in your notes. Is that right? I will give you a copy of this diagram. Right, if we do a calculation of the time taken for the carbon to escape from the plate, then at the temperatures where bainite forms, it's a fraction of a second. So by the time you come to do a chemical analysis, you know, things have changed. So this is a very serious problem. We don't know how to measure the carbon concentration in the plate of bainite as it grows. There's no way you can do it experimentally because things will change by the time you make an observation. Quench it really quickly and then measure the ones at the tip of the sheet. Right. Which would be the paper, the newest ones in the book. Right. 
Unfortunately, this is simply too fast. Okay? And carbon can be mobile you know, even as I quench. This is still one second. Yeah? Yeah. Um, what you could do, and what we have done very recently, is actually transform the bainite at a very low temperature by designing an alloy which transforms at a very low temperature. But let me show you another way, which is convincing even for the high temperature systems. Now, just to remind you what the T0 curve is, uh, this point represents the point where ferrite and austenite of the same chemical composition have the same free energy. If I take austenite of this composition and attempt to, to transform it without any diffusion, to ferrite, then I would get an increase in free energy. So that's not possible. On the other hand, if I take austenite of this composition and transform it to ferrite of the same composition, I will get a decrease in free energy. So diffusion-less transformation is possible when the carbon concentration of the austenite is less than this T0 curve. Everybody happy with that? If I have austenite of this composition, it's thermodynamically impossible to get diffusion-less transformation. So that, that's the locus of these points as a function of temperature gives me the T0 curve because this, this is for a particular temperature T1. Okay, so if the carbon concentration of the austenite exceeds the T0 curve, it's impossible to get diffusion less transformation. Of course, I can transform it into an equilibrium mixture of ferrite and austenite. So if I take that common tangent, these are the equilibrium compositions. If I decompose it into a mixture of ferrite and austenite of those compositions, I do have a reduction in free energy. So equilibrium transformation can happen if my austenite composition is less than the AE3 phase boundary, which is the boundary between the alpha plus gamma and gamma phase two. On your iron carbon phase diagram, temperature, carbon, you know, the diagram looks something like this, doesn't it? And this is alpha plus gamma and gamma. And this is called the A3 curve. That's just jargon. It's basically the phase boundary between the austenite and the austenite plus ferrite phase field. Okay? So if carbon is partitioning during transformation, we ought to be able to produce bainite even here. So let's do an experiment where we have an alloy with this carbon concentration. We transform it at this temperature, we form a plate of bainite without any diffusion at all. But it then rejects carbon within a fraction of a second. So the next plate of bainite has to form from austenite, which is richer in carbon. And again, it rejects carbon. And this process can continue, diffusion less growth, until we hit the T0 curve. After that, it is impossible. On the other hand, if carbon partitions during transformation, then it can continue until we hit the equilibrium phase boundary. Now when we do such an experiment, we do we find that the reaction stops at the T0 curve. Um, the T0 dashed curve simply allows for the strain energy due to transformation. And you can see how far it is from the equilibrium curve. So, we can prove by doing this experiment that the transformation is truly diffusionless, but the carbon then escapes into the remaining austenite and precipitates as cementite particles. So, it's almost like martensite forming and tempering itself during transformation because we are doing the transformation at a high temperature. Okay. What is the T0 time line there? So, T0 prime. Mm -hmm. these points, I get the T0 curve. 
but this is a displacing transformation and it causes strain energy. I have to allow for that strain energy when I plot these curves. So this is now alpha plus strain. And you can see that the intersection happens at a lower carbon concentration then. So all I'm doing here is that I'm allowing for the strain energy due to displacement transformation. It's not a very big effect compared with this. Okay, now of course, when you propose uh, such a theory, it also makes a lot of other predictions. For example, that the growth rate must, if you measure the growth rate of individual platelets of bainite, then they, mu they must be much greater than allowed by the diffusion of carbon, because carbon doesn't diffuse during growth, it partitions after the transformation. So I want you to watch this uh, image. I'm going to show you uh, some images at one second intervals. This is uh, another instrument. You're probably getting tired of all these instruments, but this is a nice instrument. It's called a photo emission electron microscope where we can observe transformations as they happen at a high temperature in a bulk sample. Uh, there will be plates of bainite growing from here. Okay. Oops, the daisy. Okay. So, there's one at one second intervals, and we can measure that growth rate, and we can prove that that is several orders of magnitude higher than would be allowed by the diffusion of carbon. Can we see that again? Yeah, yeah sure. Right, so this and many other features of the transformation are compatible with the model that I showed you and we naturally explain the difference between upper and lower value. Now, this is available on the website, so you can watch that movie as many times as you want again. Okay. <laughs> Now that finishes uh, the vein of transformation. The mechanism of transformation is displacive. We can see the displacements and measure them. The transformation temperature is higher than that of martensite. The consequence of that is that we have a lower driving force and the material tempers itself during transformation. But nevertheless, it grows without diffusion. The tempering happens after the growth event. Carbon escapes into the remaining austenite. Uh, another major consequence is that the austenite is weak at high temperatures, mechanically weak, and therefore the shape change causes plastic accommodation, which stops the growth of the plane. So we get a very fine microstructure. And that is the reason why we see a microstructure consisting of hundreds of plates. Okay. Now, we haven't finished the lecture, we've just finished bainite. Uh, I want to summarize the differences between displacive and reconstructive transformation and raise the temperature a little bit more. So, I don't know if I showed you this slide before, but let's imagine we have a crystal here with square and round atoms, and this is the unit cell. I can do displacive transformation simply by deforming the unit cell, and because I change the pattern in which the atoms are arranged, I will change the external shape. And that's the displacement that we observe using optical interference microscopy, scratches being deflected, or atomic force microscopy. And there is an atomic correspondence between the parent and the product phases. You can see that these are in exactly the same sequence in both phases. And that's why we have a memory. If I reverse the transformation, I regain the shape. Okay. By contrast, reconstructive transformation, we break all the bonds, we achieve the new crystal structure without changing the overall shape. So you can imagine this as being this, plus if I cut off the triangle here and transport it onto this side, then I achieve this. Okay, so that cutting off and transporting is the diffusion that's necessary. Okay. In that process, the square atoms have all moved into the parent phase, okay, because they're happier there. In this case, whether they like it or not, they're trapped inside that phase. 
So that is the essential difference between reconstructive and displacive transmissions. And you can think of it as follows as well. This is a very good analogy. We have a queue of soldiers here, highly disciplined, and they are in a particular sequence. And the military transport arrives and they are ordered to board the bus. They board it in exactly that sequence, so I can identify the correspondence between the queue and the seats in the bus. Okay, so that's the memory. They have to sit in that position whether they like it or not, so there's a lot of strain energy. Now, by contrast, we have a queue of civilians. As soon as the bus arrives, they board the bus, you know, in an irregular order, no coordination, and they sit next to their friends, so they're quite happy. But there is a, a third kind of transmission that I want to talk about. So we have civilian, we have military, what comes in between? Hmm? <laughs> Sorry? Sorry? Yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, in between civilian and military, we call that the paramilitary. So they, are, they have some discipline, but not as much as soldiers. Okay, so this is paramilitary transformation, where we also have small atoms, like carbon. Okay? And although we maintain an atomic correspondence for the large atoms, the iron atoms, the manganese atoms, and silicon atoms, we get diffusion of the small atoms. So during the course of transformation, the small atoms partition between the phases according to where they can lower their free energy. And that transformation happens in steels as I go to even higher temperature than A night. I produce these coarse plates of Wiedemann Staten ferrite. Now these plates of Wiedemann Staten ferrite look like this. You can see the scale here, this is an optical micrograph. These are very clean plates, there's no structure inside them. And they have the shape of thin wedges. Now, again, if I look at the shape deformation, and this time I'm showing you the deflection of scratches, you can see the scratch is sheared, yeah? or the Tolansky interference micro micro microscopy, but you can see these interference fringes are displaced. So what, what's happening is, again, this is a displacive transformation. Right? But it is forming above the T0 temperature. It is impossible for it to be diffusionless. The carbon, which is the interstitial atom, partitions during the growth of these plates. So it is truly a paramilitary transformation where the substitutional lattice is displaced. So you change the crystal structure by a deformation, but the deformation occurs at a rate which allows the carbon atoms to partition. So it is not even possible for this to be a diffusion less transformation. Carbon must partition during its growth, and the displacing transformation must occur at a rate which allows that carbon to partition. And that's the reason why uh, I said to you that you know, martensite inside doesn't have to grow at the speed of sound in the metal. It can grow at that speed, but it doesn't have to. You can get a displacing transformation which is slow. Now, the other aspect is that we are growing this at a high temperature, where the driving force is small. And in the last lecture I told you that the strain energy due to the shape change is of the order of 600 joules per mole. And that is very large. As you go to higher and higher temperatures, you can't sustain that strain energy. There isn't enough driving force. So what happens is something really clever. Instead of forming individual plates like this, where the strain energy would be that much, you form two plates together, which tend to cancel out each other's shape change. So one plate shears in that direction and the other one in that. But in that way, you can reduce this term to something of the order of 50 joules per mole. Now, there is a cost to this, and that is that you have to nucleate the right two plates at the same time. Yeah. Um, another consequence is that these two are crystallographically different plates, and therefore they have 
different variants of the habit pin. So for example, this is close to 558, whereas this is close to 585. And that's what gives us the thin red shape that I showed you in the optical microphone. Furthermore, you should be able to pick up a boundary between these two plates if you look using a transmission electron microphone. And that's exactly what you see. So you have pairs of plates growing cooperatively because there isn't enough free energy change to sustain the shape deformation. So they tend to form in self-accommodating pairs of plates. And if you measure the growth rate, the plates grow at a rate which is controlled by the diffusion of carbon in the parent phase ahead of the interface. <coughs> so to summarize, and this is the last displacive transformation that happens in steels. The mechanism is displacive, but it is absolutely essential for carbon to partition during growth. Without carbon partitioning, it cannot grow because it can form above the T0 temperature. And it's a clever transformation in the sense that you form a pair of plates at the same time in such a way that they tend to cancel out each other's shape deformation. And that also explains why you get a thin Wedge shape. So it's a paramilitary transmission. So you still have shape memory when you reverse it? It is difficult to reverse it because you've done something irreversible, which is the partitioning of carbon. The carbon can just diffuse back in. Is it? Yeah, but how do you cause that to diffuse back in using a stress? The, the, the diffusion is uncoordinated, it's irreversible. Uh, so you cannot reverse that part. So you do not actually, there's no chance of reversing this by applying a stress. You know, to, to reverse something, you cannot have dissipated energy. Uh, and diffusion actually occurs in order to dissipate energy. So there's no chance of a shape memory effect. And back to the daylight with the sheet. Mm -hmm. um, you showed the graph of it, it stops at T0. So, therefore, it's the, the, the size of the sheets and the function of the carbon constant the Yeah. They, they actually follow the equation. Yeah. Absolutely. It's not the size, but the volume fraction. Volume. Yeah, so if, if I just go back to that slide. Uh, now, yeah. So you can see that uh, the volume fraction that I can form depends on the difference between this curve and this curve. If this curve is at higher carbon concentrations, I can form more bainite. Or alternatively, if I have a higher carbon concentration, I will form less bainite. Now, this is a very important point, which we'll use in the case study that we do in one of the lectures. Okay, so, remember this T0 curve, it's very important. Okay, see you in the next lecture. <laughs>